A few weeks ago, Pastor Jim used as his text um, passages surrounding the text that I'll be using today. And in reading Psalm 139, we see the psalmist, the writer, is telling of this very close personal relationship that the psalmist has with God, and of course, that God is intimately acquainted with the psalmist. But he skipped over verses 7 through 12. They weren't part of the reading at that time. But we'll see in our verses today that the psalmist, understanding the depth of God's knowledge of him, and in awe of the power of the presence of God, the writer decides to take flight into speculation and wonders, is there a place perhaps where this awesome God might not be? And that's what we have here in Psalm 139, verses 7 through 12, page 503 in your pew Bible. And it reads, where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and settle at the farthest limits of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light around me become night, even the darkness is not night to you. The night is as bright as the day, for darkness is as light to you. Let us pray. Lord, in the depths of the deepest places where we may find ourselves, please continue to remind us that you are always with us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Yes, there is a Super Bowl going on today, but as a person who was born and raised in Chicago and grew up with the Bears, the Blackhawks, the Cubs, and the White Sox, and the Bulls, there will be no references in this sermon today to the sports teams. If a Chicago team is not playing, it's not worth my attention. <laughs> so, there won't be any references to that. <laughs> a couple of months ago, I ordered um, some t-shirts with musical themes and puns. And one of those t-shirts says, my brain is 80% song lyrics. And those of you who know me probably have already figured out my brain is 80% song lyrics. And those lyrics aren't always hymns. In fact, when I was looking at the verses for today, the first song that came into my head is, I always feel like somebody's watching me, and I get no privacy. Oh. <laughs> Which I suppose is one way to look at these verses. But rather than the negative and paranoia, let us build on a positive perspective we can find from these verses and the preceding verses about a God who sees us, knows us, and loves us. I see you, I know you, I love you. What does it mean when I say, I see you? For those of us who are finite human beings, we acknowledge and we have to realize we sometimes make assumptions about people, about what we see when we see them. Now that's not good or bad unless our assumptions influence the way in which we treat another person. I see you. I see you. I acknowledge your race. I see you. What are you wearing? Is it mundane, expensive, or flashy? And when we think about flashy, that can be very subjective. But just from seeing you, I cannot tell if you are a righteous Star Trek fan or one of those heathens who believe in the Force in Star Wars. 
Just in seeing me, you can't tell unless I'm wearing my original series Star Trek shirt or my Spock socks that I am a Star Trek fan. What about music? Is it eclectic? Or does it run more toward the traditional? And even that's subjective, because what is traditional to you may not be traditional to me. In a world in which people feel lost or ignored, to be seen is positive. Because we know in our world, in these days, people are not always seen. People's humanity is not always acknowledged. However, seeing someone, acknowledging their humanity, and just speaking to them is the first step. Do I know you? I know you. Once we see someone, what comes next? Well, it depends on the circumstance, and I'm going to use our circumstance here when um, we gather together as a body here at church, and we have people come in and we see them and acknowledge them. In Pastor Jim's sermon a few weeks ago, he lifted up our church theme, which is be kind to one another, and challenged us to do more than just give lip service to the theme. For us humans, the idea of getting to know someone is not always easy, and that can be for any number of reasons it can be difficult. It means taking time, giving our time, and sometimes giving a part of ourselves. It's more than just listening. It's hearing what someone is saying to us. It's being able to listen, to hear the words, but also to be able to see what is behind the words that people are speaking. It's true that it calls on a certain vulnerability on the person who we're seeking to know, and also on us. It means exposing who we are to someone else. Yet it might not be as difficult as one might imagine. In our culture, um, the asking of how someone is doing has taken on the aspect of simply a greeting. Most times when you ask someone how they're doing, the response is, I'm okay, I'm all right, or I'm fine. Any more than that requires time on our part, but it also requires trust on the part of the person with whom we are conversing. Do they trust us? Do we trust them? Years ago, after hearing a sermon um, from my previous pastor, I decided that for me, when I ask you, how are you, it's more than just a greeting. I decided to be intentional in the asking. So I only ask, how are you doing, if I'm ready to hear, really, how you are doing. So you'll probably pay more attention to me now when I greet you to see if I ask you that. In fact, when we were preparing for a short-term mission trip to Senegal, we were instructed um, in our greeting that we should also ask about a person's family. So it's, hello, how are you doing? How is your family? That goes a little bit further in greeting. In one sermon, I put forth the idea that if we really, really want to know how someone is doing, then maybe we should ask, how is your heart? Of course, after last week, that question has taken on a whole new meaning for me. But it is in the hearing and listening and getting past the perfunctory responses that we come to a place of more than seeing. We get closer to knowing who a person really is. Now, knowing who a person is can be dangerous. Because what if we find out that that person although a fan of Star Trek, he started out on that um, level, we find that they are persons who love the next generation. When we all know that Deep Space Nine was the 
best of the Star Trek television series. Can we get past that? The psalmist speaks of God as knowing him intimately, so much so that what is on the heart of the psalmist, even before he speaks it, he said, God knows it. Now, we may not know people in that way or be known by anyone else, but we are able. If we are willing to take the time, we can get a glimpse into the heart of a person and what is important to them. Again, I said it, it can be dangerous, especially in our fractured world today where we seem to be so divided, can we get past the idea that, oh, you know, this person doesn't quite think like I do politically, but they are still a child of God. Let's get to know each other, and maybe we can agree or disagree um, civilly. God sees us. We see people. God knows us. We get to know people. Where does love come in? Love comes in next. One of the beauties of our relationship with God is that he knows us and loves us, knows us intimately. We don't know how we'll act and react in circumstances of life, but you know what? God does know, and his love never wavers. For us as humans, we may see and know, but that love can be fractured based on what we are seeing and what we know about someone else. Then this is so true in these days, in this, especially in this country, in this very divided political climate. Um, it reminds me of um, talking about love and it's not always easy, and it can be radical. One of our retreat speakers, Reverend Ann Jefferson, the theme we were talking about was love. And it was during the time when 45 was president. And she said to radically love means to love 45. I still have issues around that. But radical love, radical love, Jesus talked about loving our enemies, but radical love. And like I said, it's so true in our divided political climate. Psalm 27 tells us that it is even possible for a parent to forsake their child but the Lord will take them up. And in Isaiah 49, the writer puts forth the possibility of a woman not showing compassion to her own child, but emphasizes that God does have compassion and will show compassion. In our text, the psalmist is so very much aware of God's love, of God's constant presence, that he has to step back and speculate or postulate, where is it that I can be that God is not? If I go to heaven, oh, well, of course, God is there. The realm of the dead, the Sheol, God is there. Perhaps there is some place on this earth that I can go to that God is not there. Or if the psalmist were writing today, he might write, is there some remote part of the galaxy or the universe that I can separate myself from God? No, 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 no. God's arms are way too long. They reach even to the remotest parts of the earth and the galaxy. And he asks, how about if I shroud myself in darkness? if I cover myself with darkness. And the hymn writer realizes, no, not even darkness, not even darkness can keep me away from God because God is light. He brings light. 
As we move through our days and our journeys in life, these may not be the questions we consider when we think about God and God's presence. But we still may think, what is it in life that might separate us from God? Or what circumstance might we find ourselves in that is beyond the presence of God or the place where God can help us? A lot of times we wonder if God is with us when we are in the depths of despair. Where is God when my heart is broken by another person? Where is God when my family has deserted me? Where is God when I pray and pray and pray for recovery, but the illness has taken me over? Where is God when I am left alone, when a loved one passes on? Where is God when we look at our world and see the suffering that is taking place, not only in other parts of the world, but right here in our own community. Where is God? The question we might ask. Howard Thurman, in his book, Meditations of the Heart, begins with a meditation entitled, An Island of Peace Within One's Soul. And in it, he writes that the only possibility of stability for the person is to establish an island of peace within one's own soul. To this island we bring no pretense, no dishonesty. What one really thinks and feels about one's own life stands revealed. What one really thinks and feels about other people, far and near, is seen with every nuance honestly labeled. Love is love, hate is hate, and fear is fear. I had to read that over a few times because honestly, to me, it sounded scary. And in one sense, I started to wonder, well, how can this be an island of peace within my own heart when I'm bringing the difficult things to this island, to this place? Well, I was discussing it with a counselor, and they put forth the idea that once we bring what our honest feelings are before God to this island, to this place in our heart, that means we are no longer carrying them within ourselves. And of course, it reminded me of the old hymn, take your burden to the Lord and leave it there. It also makes sense because earlier in the psalm, the writer says God already knows our every thought. So there's nothing that we're hiding from God. It's more like we're hiding it, either hiding it from ourselves or keeping it locked deep within when we can build out this place within our heart to bring all of who we are, of what we're thinking, honestly, to this place, to God. And I have to say that I have not built that island of peace within my own heart. I'm still working on it. But it really sounds good. God sees us. God knows us and loves us still. And we, in our honesty, are aware of the places where we need to be more like Jesus. And maybe that is one of the reasons we have to be honest about who we are, what we're thinking, and where we are in this life. We need to realize there is no circumstance in life, whether coming from the outside from someone else or the trouble that we sometimes make for our own selves that will separate us from God. Sometimes 
we need to remind ourselves of the truth that is found in the words of Scripture and in the words of preparation um, in your bulletin. They come from Howard Thurman, and I want to add a paragraph to that. He writes, God is with me. Again and again, I am stirred by some experience of tenderness, some simple act of gratuitous kindness, moving from one person to another, some quiet deed of courage, wisdom or sacrifice, or some striking movement of unstudied joy that bursts forth in the contagion of merry laughter. I know God is with me. And then the words in your bulletin, God is with me. Always there is the persistent need for some deep inner assurance, some whisper in my heart, some stirring of the spirit within me that renews, recreates, and steadies. Then, whatever betides of light or shadow, I can look out on life with quiet eyes. God is with us. God is always with us, whatever we're going through, because God sees us, God knows us, and God loves us. And in that example, God wants us to see one another, to take the time to get to know one another, and to truly and deeply love one another, to be more and more like Jesus.